Hi everybody, welcome to uh, episode 35 of the Alexis L podcast and we have a particularly uh, special guest today, uh, Bassem Yusuf really and um, I, I try and um, disguise my lack of research by saying Bassem, tell me your story. <laughs> <laughs> where to begin <laughs> where? well uh i was a heart surgeon in egypt that's the short version i was a heart surgeon in egypt turned into a political satirist had my own show in egypt got kicked out escaped and now in the united states trying to reinvent myself in a different form of comedy in a different language for a different audience and now i'm in europe doing my european tour uh and an english stand-up which is also another uh uh, challenge since you know uh, mm. outside of England <laughs> English might not be the first language where people would gravitate to with the English stand-up comedy so that's the um, no mm. that's the uh, that's that's the short version of the story right well there's a there's a lot to unpack uh, there where are you so this is your first European tour yeah I just landed in Paris I'm st I'm having my first show yeah. in, in Paris after tomorrow and then the, I will go to do 10 European cities in 20 days including three cities in the UK London Manchester and Birmingham and Talal is going to be opening for a couple of shows uh, yeah. I'm very excited to work with Talal actually so uh, it's going to be fun in London yeah yeah He's a good boy. I've taught him everything he knows. <laughs> <laughs> you're playing the you're playing the South Bank Centre in London. Yes, uh, which is a, yeah, which is a lovely it's room. It's a huge theater, and uh, I'm I'm very excited yeah. to be playing it there. And uh, mm. um, it's kind of like it's it's that's on the 9th of March. Yeah, the um, uh, 9th of March in London, 10th of March in Birmingham, and 11th in Manchester. And twelve in Copenhagen, so it's kind of like it's a, it's a very great <laughs> tour. Um, yeah. it, it's going to be interesting, and I I have a, I have a like faith that this will be like a, a good tour where I know more about myself, more about the communities here, and more about the Arab diaspora that will come to the show, and hopefully a lot of non Arabs will come to the show too. Yeah, I mean, who, uh -huh. it will be global for everyone. You don't have to be from the enjoy it. yeah so you will be performing in english yes sir yes everywhere but but the, your audience will largely be arab you think from the arab diaspora yeah i have been performing in english in america i've been having like a, a big american tour and this is the first time i do it outside of north america i did america i did a lot of canadian cities mm -hmm. and it's gonna this is my european tour so uh um, uh, okay, finger crossed. <laughs> Fantastic. So, 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 um, so then, I mean, go back in time, really. You were presumably this was you were you were a heart surgeon during the the Mubarak era of in in Egypt, is that right? Yes, uh, under Mubarak, I was a heart surgeon, and I was actually prepared to leave Egypt to start a fellowship in America. And then the Arab Spring happened, and uh, all my life I followed John Stewart. I loved his brand of comedy, his brand of political satire. So I did like a few, um, like YouTube videos satirizing the state-run media that was spreading all kinds of lies and misinformation. And and uh, when I the, the the videos went viral, and before I know it, I'm signing my first television deal, and now I'm hosting a television deal, a political satire show, that is. Um, satirizing the uh, political uh, events in Egypt. Uh, people love the show, the government not so much. And that's when I first became aware of you, actually. Yes. Um, this, this is like, I don't know, 10, 10 or more years ago? Uh, I started in and 2011. 2011, yeah. And I m my mom actually introduced me to you because she's like, Talal, Talal, you, you like the comedy, right? You should you should see this man, he, he's... <laughs> he's incredible and she was like so blown away because and then so was i because you don't see that in the middle east you know you well, that's what i was going to say i mean is there was yeah. there any kind of tradition of, of of satire in the middle east it's obviously the the risks that it's no, not no. without danger is it uh, satire and comedy has been extreme was always been there in egypt especially Egypt, they've been very strong. There's a strong tradition. The satirists and the comedians in Egypt has been amazing. But the thing is, as far as political satire, that was not a brand that was there. 
uh, it has, and there has been some satire, a little bit political, but it's always been sanctioned and accepted and allowed by the government. The whole idea of like the free falling satire that we can say anything we want, we can we can take punches uh, uh, to the government or the authority or the president was not even allowed. You always had some sort of a, a ceiling where you cannot go past. So when the um, the Arab Spring happened. There was a kind of like a fluid stage of ideas and comedy. And for the first time, we were allowed to talk about anything we want. And so th this is why the show thrived, because there was um, um, a, a, an atmosphere of freedom that allowed people to do so. But however, it was not like the Western world, which has been the, the art of satire has been established. We had to carve our space into uh, into that field. And that caught, caught me into trouble. So under the Islamist, I was interrogated. There was a warrant for my arrest, and I had to actually be in an interrogation for six hours in a room to explain my jokes to the interrogator. And uh, under the military, I had my show canceled twice, and I eventually got had to escape from uh, from uh, from Egypt and go to uh, live in the United States. So it was a very short-lived dream <laughs> that was abruptly cut. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how do you? I mean, how do you feel about the Arab Spring now? Did I mean it's? Uh, it seems to me to be obviously a, uh, you know, tragic interlude in a way, and the things are worse in Egypt now than they were even under Mubarak. It's, you know, I don't know, maybe you think not, but I mean, um, uh, and also it's about the Western, you know, it's about the evil interference of the West. Well, um, yes, it is not as as good as we hoped for. <laughs> but uh, looking through history, ninety percent of revolutions fail, and only ten percent of revolutions that right. might actually work it works after a very long time. So, if you want to talk from the political aspect, yes, I think the whatever we hoped for in the Arab Spring did not work. But at the same time, as much as it is. Um, uh, disappointing to have that kind of failure it has opened the minds and uh, of, of a lot of young people in Egypt I think now there is I always say the revolution is not an event a revolution is a process and uh, you might find the, the the seeds that this revolution have planted to flourish maybe in the next generation maybe we the people who witnessed the revolution might not actually see anything or be or benefit uh from uh, uh from it but uh, at the end of the day you might find that the uh, following generations can actually uh be the result of that kind of freedom that we have because it allowed people to talk about stuff that was not even allowed to talk about uh, where there is like religion tradition um uh, uh politics so again it's a, it's a process now about the evil interference with the west it's very easy to of course to blame the West for everything, but like you know, we carry part of that uh, <laughs> responsibility too. Like, uh, like for example, you can blame America all you want about invading Iraq, which is of course evil. But we have to remember that it was also a dictator who invaded another country, who uh, who um, oppressed his own people, making it uh, easy and uh, and 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 kind of. Uh, um, path like paved the way for for america to uh, for, the, for the west to come in um the west to also prop that same dictator i think the relationship between the west and the middle east and many of the third world countries is as uh of course we want democracy but as long as you buy weapons from us you can do whatever you want and that is kind <laughs> of like the relationship that has always been gone between that so you find like a, a president any president who comes to power and the West, like, like you know, is all about like freedom and and freedom of expression. And once you start buying their weapons, they don't, they, 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 they basically there's like there's a blind eye for whatever he wants to do with his people. Absolutely, yeah. Did you have any live experience between kind of going from heart surgeon to TV satirist? Did you? Or was it just through watching like John Stewart and stuff on there? No, I never had any kind of live experience. I never performed. I never, I never did actually do comedy before. My first ever time to do comedy was in front of television cameras. 
uh, and <laughs> it, uh, it was a bumpy road. It was more of a trial and error. I learned on the job. Uh, so if yeah. you actually look to my uh, now, when I look to my earliest work, I said, like, "Oh my God, that was terrible." But I think because there was nothing, <laughs> it was accepted by the public, and I was allowed yes. to kind of <laughs> paint on the job and be better. You know, <laughs> it helps if there's nobody came before you, doesn't it? Really? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like no, there is no reference. Like, oh, it's great, and I said, like, "No, guys, that's 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 terrible." But you just you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Very, it was very. That was certainly my 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 technique in the early part of my career. So, <laughs> was Western comedy at all um, popular in uh, in Egypt? Yes. Uh, well, to, it really depends on what what kind of education you have in Egypt. If you went to uh, a, a, right. an English language school or a, a Western school in Egypt, which is I would say a very small percentage of the the public would go. You would follow Seinfeld. You would follow Frasier. You would follow Friends. Uh, you would follow uh, Eddie Murphy. Um, and and you have to understand, like in the, growing up in the eighties and the nineties, there was no internet. So these kind of like things that trickled to us. We would. I remember uh, I was a big fan of the NBA, the National Basketball Association, and Michael Jordan. And we didn't get the game, so we we would wait for videotapes to come from America <laughs> to watch the NBA. Same thing with Friends, you know, like, yeah. uh, oh. all of the illegal downloads to get Friends. Or I remember like 2005 when the whole thing we're watching that TV show Lost and we had to kind of wait till, till the legal download to come. Now uh, with with the streaming, with the satellite, it's, of course it's different, but like uh, we are the uh, generation of uh, the dial-up internet. So uh, at the time, we had to kind of like work hard to <laughs> yes. get our material <laughs> yeah. to the West. Yeah, the kids today, they don't know they're born, do they? They're, oh, yeah, they're, yeah, they're with, their, <laughs> with their Netflix. Oh, yeah, with their Netflix. Yeah, <laughs> bastards. <laughs> was, was there, <laughs> Goddamn. Was there any, any um, British, as, as the former imperial power, was there any, um, any <laughs> British <laughs> stuff to... That you well, liked, or uh, that, you know, that uh, we didn't weird. have with in entertainment. We didn't have that much of an British. It was more American, uh, all the way from the Muppet Show to Friends to Seinfeld. We had some British comedy show playing, like for example, Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, and uh, and Upstairs Downstairs. The <laughs> the uh, we, we these are like the British <laughs> shows that were 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 popular. You have to understand, like at the end at that time. We only had government television. We didn't have that much of satellite. So it was whatever the government sees yeah. uh, fit for us to watch. So whether it was uh, America, we'd watch Magnum and uh, Stargate and uh, Ing uh, and MacGyver. <laughs> and uh, for England, we from England we'd watch Yes Minister uh, and uh, Yes Minister uh, and Yes Prime Minister, which is like one of my absolute favorite show and mr bean surely you got mr bean oh yeah, yeah everybody yeah. gets well, it. mr bean mr. not mr bean, yeah, mr. bean because they're, they're basically there was no there was no dialogue there's like a guy just doing faces so it because you don't have you have to uh, understand english yeah <laughs> mr fucking bean <laughs> <laughs> that's the episode title there um, mr. Fucking bean. mr fucking bean what kind of material would you do then if uh you know i mean now or in the early days really i mean what's the so uh, if you talk about change, now, really, I suppose. If, 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 I, I, if you're talking about like at the early days, the early days was basically what I did was a current political satire show, like the Daily Show in in uh, by John Stewart. Basically, whatever happens in the country, we would talk mm -hmm. about and we discuss it. Of course, after I left Egypt and I went to America, that I you know I went to a saturated market and I I had absolutely no way to penetrate the market in television because you know you might be the biggest thing in egypt and the middle east but you're an absolute no one in america so i i, I had to reinvent myself yeah. in a way that i do stand-up comedy which i never did before in english which i never did before and now my stand-up comedy show which i tour around in the united states and the one i'm touring right now in europe is basically my story. It's a story about like a, a, a heart surgeon wow. growing up in Egypt, yeah. having to be to be to do medicine because his parents wanted him to do it. And then the Arab Spring happens. He turned into a political satire. I talk about the investigation, about the pressure doing the show, and then I, I and then I talk about like leaving Egypt, going to America as Trump becoming president, and what does that mean for a newly immigrant 
person like a, 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 newly, a, a new immigrant like me going to America. And there's a, basically the show is my story. Every single it's it's not like a it's not a, a joke based show. It is a it's a story based show. Each it's it's like a a multi uh, 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 many scenes from my life stitched together to draw the story of my life from America, be from Egypt all the way to America, and what does it mean today for me trying to follow other people's expectations that has always been put for me. And in, in the show, put this way, is a way that a lot of people can relate to the show. In America, uh, not just Middle Eastern come to my show. Americans, immigrants, white Americans, black Americans, Asian Americans, they come and they find themselves in the show somehow. It is a show that actually gets people, you will find yourself into that story, even if my story is completely different than yours. Right. One of the things I've been thinking, what do you think is the effect or the, I mean, it's an impossible question to answer in a way, but what do you think is the effect of satire, of satirical comedy? Does it ultimately just make people, make it easier for people to put up with their, their oppression? Or does it, uh, how, do you think it has a kind of uh, a revolutionary effect right well the um big question perhaps. uh comedy and satire especially political satire allows people to discuss dull ideas in a way that is uh, uh that is funny that mm -hmm. is attractive uh you can talk about uh, things that are related to military budget or uh international interfe imperial interference in 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 people's lives uh, and you can talk about it in um uh, in a serious way, but people will fall asleep or not going to be interested. Or you can use satire to bring that uh, topic to them to to have to open a discussion. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the other big uh, thing about satire, especially political satire, especially in countries where there is more of an authoritarian uh, mood of governance, is that. It is very dangerous for authoritarian uh, leaders uh, because authoritarian leaders only use fear. And if, if they want you to make you afraid of them, they want you to make worry about your safety. When you take that and you make fun of it, I always say you cannot be afraid of something that you're laughing at. If you're laughing at something, you're not scared of it anymore. And this is why authoritarian leaders are very sensitive to satire. They're very, actually, very aggressive. Even now in America, which there is an established democracy in America, there, the art of political satire is established. Even then, Donald Trump, because he is from that mindset, authoritarian mindset, although he is still in a democratic system, he boycotted the, the White House Correspondent Dinner, the only right. president in the history of America who boycott the White House Correspondent Dinner, which is an annual event where uh, a comedian comes up and he rips the president apart and he makes fun of them right there as he's sitting. And then the president comes up and he makes fun of himself and the others. And it's a more of a, like a celebration of freedom of speech, even if that was a facade, but it is a symbolic gesture. Uh, Donald Trump is the only president in the history of America who boycotted the four years of his presidency and he never went there. Even Ronald Reagan, when he was shot, he <laughs> called in from the hospital because he knew how, I mean, you can talk about whatever you want about like George W. Bush or Reagan or or all of the other Republicans, but they 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 kept that kind of tradition because it's important even uh, if it was a show to show people that you can still talk up and you can still speak and you can still make fun. So uh, this is why, like, when Hitler came, at his first target was the caricaturist, his first target was the satirist. They, always the comedians are the ones who always get picked up on in the beginning because they are the king gesture. They are the people who make fun. They are the basically the people that show you the king naked. And this is very uh, dangerous for the authoritarian leaders because... It doesn't doesn't serve their agenda of making people live in constant fear. Oh, thank you. It's amazing. Yes, we had well. So we had our own. We had our own Jeremy Corbyn spring here. I don't know if you followed any of that really uh, a few years ago. Jeremy Corbyn. 
Yeah, no, you didn't. There was a so um about in twenty when was it twenty fifteen twenty sixteen uh, um th- through a th- so basically through an accident this guy got elected to the leadership of the Labour Party the other major party in the sort of equivalent more or less of the Democrats in uh, yeah, yeah and he was um, pro Palestinian anti colonial. Um, anti-capitalist but still nevertheless a democrat and um that really um shook up the establishment in 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 britain Mm. and um he he was he proved himself to be a tremendous threat but comedians i think comedians really let the side down really because they allowed the comedians here allowed themselves to be intimidated really and didn't apart from me (laughs) <laughs> didn't really yeah. back him and um the yeah they all bunch of the shit, line. really yeah <laughs> they 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 really all they allowed themselves to be i guess subversive i mean do they so I, I don't know what point i'm what what where, well, it's, where it's I'm just going embarrassing with this is... because the stakes are so like what basim did in egypt the stakes were so high and yet you continued to to do your thing, even with the threat of arrest, with the death threats, with all this stuff, you didn't cower from what you were doing. Well, well, I, I, I did it until I couldn't. You know, as a matter of fact, it's funny that you say that. Like for you, for Westerns, uh, people uh, look at me as like, oh my God, you're brave. Look at what you did. For many Egyptians, they think I'm a coward and I'm a sellout that I did I, because I left and I didn't allow myself to be put in jail. Which is another point that I want to speak about, which is having <laughs> to put too much pressure on comedians comedians are not saints or comedians are not heroes comedians are not political activists they can use their comedy in order to push their opinions of course but if it is too dangerous you should not be hurt for other people's problems because this is the i i know that a lot of people i know that i might have a pushback the whole idea about putting com- comedians on a pedestal and the reason that happens is that comedians come and make fun in an, in an environment where everything is dysfunctional. Media is dysfunctional, policy is dysfunctional. So people look at comedians and they's like, they are the only people who can do their job well. They make fun of the establishment, they're good at what they do, and then suddenly they gravitate to them and then they just like put too much hope on them. And that is very dangerous because seriously, like my role as a comedian stops at the edge of the screen or the stops or at the edge of the theater. I should not go to jail so people can feel good about themselves. And this is, I think, that like a big thing about like how is like comedy and activism can interact. Yes, of course. Mm. At, at the end of the day, I'm a citizen. I'm a human being. I want my country or the, whatever country that I live in is better. So I use comedy to criticize. But at the same time, I should not be criticized or penalized because I could not do continue doing it because there's a threat for me or my family. And I think that is the thing about like, uh, there's a lot of like uh, couch warmers, bench warmers who sit around and just want stuff happen to themselves. And the other negative part of comedy and satire, because there is a negative part, a lot of people uh, watch satirists and comedians rip apart the people that they don't like, and they feel that they have done their job. Then they just do nothing. So uh, a lot of people just watch the comedy and the satire and the making fun of things. And then when it happens, when it's time to elections, they don't go vote. Uh, when right, when yeah. Donald Trump was in, and there's like a million women march in the streets of Los Angeles. And people like went out, they went there for the Instagram opportunities and the pictures and the, and the funny little smart uh, uh, banners that they did. And then the next week, there were local elections. Only 12% showed up. You, you see? So... I think it is very important to be mindful about to decide the role of comedy. Comedy is important, satire is important, but it cannot do everything. As what well, I mean, there is like a very famous saying that says, "Prayers don't change things. Prayers change people, and people change things." Same with comedy, right? So at the end of the day, you do your role, but you cannot really be responsible about changing everything. Yeah, I mean that's a fantastic point. I think that that's uh, I, I you've articulated so many things that I vaguely well, and and shame on anyone who called you a chicken for for not wanting to go to jail. That's ridiculous. And 
you know, yeah, like, yeah. I, I, oh no, no, I am, I, I for, is for many people for the ultra revolutions for many Islamists. I'm like, I'm the guy who bailed out and 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 is and left Egypt. It's like because you're you're away. It's like and you not know, don't speak about <laughs> things in Egypt because I'm in America. Yes, because I'm in America and now I am in a different country and my my comedy reflects my life there. Is that they just want people to go in and do their job for them and yeah. and they just want to like and and I, and I kind of like. I from the very beginning I said I'm a comedian I'm a political satirist I I love what I do but I'm not going to be involved in politics and I had like so many offers to be in political parties like I said yeah. no 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 I'm a comedian I do this yeah. because I love it and if you guys have a beef I am not someone who's going there to fight with the uh, uh, intelligence apparatus and the government so you can feel good about yourself yeah yeah i think it's very yeah i mean i, I think it's so important that the committee that what our job is is to make comedy is to make art out of you know the things that we see but we should never we should never become activists we should never become um you know academics we should never write books about we're not we're not freedom fighters i know that is very like romanticized over romanticizing yeah. of comedians is very dangerous. Yeah, and some of it in a way are. I mean, it, part of the message of what we're saying is our, uh, the, our, our, I think, the kind of ambiguous nature of who we are that we're not heroes. That's an important part of of com of of, our, of well, I think of our, of my comedy certainly is to always emphasize that um, you know, <laughs> you know, don't I, I'm very flawed really. <laughs> Um, but what I think what we were getting at is that the comedians here didn't even have any threat of of danger. It was more they were protecting their careers or their commercial interests by not yeah, getting just, by yeah. not supporting uh, socialist or, or or not vocalizing support for Palestine is a big issue here. Like a lot of people who you know it's so rare that someone will will vocalize their support for palestine even though you know that they behind closed doors they do um because they know that there's a commercial yeah people people, people are afraid. well here's the thing people are afraid because like they are afraid of like, their career and the livelihood will be affected and i understand that but the thing is it is i think here, here here's what i think i would rather that you do not speak about stuff that might hurt your career but at least they are not doing something that is does not align with their uh, beliefs. So let's say, for example, like I am supporting Palestine uh, in England. I'm, a, I'm an English comedian, but I'm, I'm afraid to speak up. I understand that. But what I will have a problem with, if you go and you do the complete opposite in, in order to get gains, I understand that you don't want to speak up because you don't want to lose. But the problem is, is what you say in order to gain something, especially if what you say does not align with your beliefs. I think that you need to make that kind of distinction, because I, I, I'm, I think like the older I get, I, like you get, the more that you understand more about people's uh, uh, circumstances, and you cannot just like ask to people to do stuff. I, I, everybody has their own issue. Everybody has their own lives, and I, I, I think it's. Uh, the whole idea about like virtue signaling and just like trying to put yourself in a in a higher moral level than other people and thinking that you are better because you say something while others don't you know all of us have limitations all of us have issues and i just focus about like my own beliefs and i and i don't kind of like try to up other people and 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 to show i i feel better about myself uh, no, that's not my approach at all. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not. <laughs> I'm just talking I about myself. Very, I take a very high. I was waiting ground. for that. <laughs> no, no, that's not me. That's not. Moral <laughs> superiority is all I have left. That's Alexi's brand. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> haughty disdain. <laughs> Tala, would you like to ask if you have any questions of Basan? Were you going? Are you uh, up for talking about this um, this film that you're going to be making as you travel, or is that going to be top secret? Oh yeah, yeah. So um, I'm actually using the opportunity of uh, this uh, trip, this Euro trip, 
uh, I, I have teamed up with a wonderful filmmaking crew from Paris. They're Egyptians, Egyptian French. And basically what I'm trying to do is instead of just like going to each city and just do my show, I said, like, I have an opportunity here to dis 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 discover these communities. So we started looking for Arab comedians who are living in these European countries. And I want to know more about the Arab diaspora, the Arab immigrant community, the Arab. There is like a whole lost generation of young Arabs after the Arab Spring who went to Europe either because of immigration, because of displacement, because of being a refugee. And there is a lot that is related to identity, racism, acceptance, not just acceptance by the European community they're living in, but also acceptance by the Arab community they come from. And I, and I thought, like, who are the best people to talk to as a window to the other community as, uh, other than the comedians. So we have lined up amazing talents, Arab comedians in every single city. And we are going to discover the Arab diaspora through the eyes of these comedians. So we have people in Oslo, in Stockholm, in Amsterdam, in Berlin, people from uh, Iraqis, Yemenis, Syrian, Egyptians, Sudanese, who have been either born as an as 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 sons and daughters uh, of immigrants or came here as immigrants we have someone who walked from greece all the way to oslo we have someone who have been who, who crossed the sea in an in a, in a refugee boat from syria and and now they are here doing comedy which for me is mind blowing how they, for them now comedy is therapy they are actually talking about their experience through comedy and they are talking about and they are having problems not just with the community they are settling in, but also the communities that they are belong to. Many of them are not even accepted by their Arab communities. They think their comedy is too much, is subversive, is not it is not appropriate. It does not it does not align with the tradition and religion of where they come from. So for me, I think shooting this docu series is going to be a it's kind of like Anthony Bourdain, but for comedians, for Arab comedians. <laughs> and I think... Um, Presumably, yeah, hopefully you're not going to kill yourself in hotel rooms. <laughs> well, you know, comedians are very yeah. known to be depressed yeah. and suicidal. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Fuck it out. So, yeah, so I, I'm very excited about discovering uh, more about this community through the eyes of comedians. I'm very, very, very excited and very yeah. uh, thrilled for this beginning this journey sounds amazing i mean i i, I want to say is it going to be on major platform we don't know i'm, I'm self-financing that show i'm i'm producing it from my i'm self-financing it and uh, hopefully after i finish that we will find a platform to do it i just got so excited and i said like i decided I, i'm not gonna wait for uh, for it to be green lit from a platform i'm going to myself finance it and do it and then hopefully we'll find a, a home for it somewhere it sounds amazing. It sounds absolutely fantastic. I mean, will it be? Will they be talking in English or in Arabic or a mixture of uh, two? Uh, mostly, it's going to be in Arabic. I'm sorry, but uh, hopefully, we're going to do another. But 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 That's you know, right. uh, yeah. they could be dubbed. It could be translated. So we will. No, we will actually. We find a way to either dub it or subtitle it so it can reach um, as many people as possible. Even English films these days, I want to watch them with subtitles because you know. <laughs> So, I'm so pretentious that uh, yes, yeah, yeah. I, I can't, I can't hear their dialogue anymore. <laughs> well, that's also true, yeah. But uh, you know, I have to. Everything has to be um, subtitled for me. Hello, all you gorgeous Taspers. TASP being short for the Alexis Sale podcast. TASPers being listeners who enjoy the Alexis Sale podcast. Is that a good nickname? Anyway, thank you for, and I hope you're enjoying, listening to this conversation with Basim Youssef. Um, I'm just popping in here to remind you to support the show. If you can, head over to patreon.com forward slash Alexis Sale podcast. Over there, you can sign up for any monthly donation and you'll be supporting the show, um, keeping me in work 
and uh, you'll get access to some cool exclusive stuff like recordings of our live shows. Um, you'll get to watch Alexi Sale, Nigel Planer and Lisa Mayer watching The Young Ones and commenting on it. And I'm putting out more of those very soon. And uh, we'll also have some more surprises on the way there. Uh, so please, if you can afford to, you can literally donate a quid a month and you'll get on the list. Uh, go to patreon.com forward slash Alexi Sale podcast. And um, another way you can support us is by coming uh, to watch me support Basim Yusuf on his UK leg of his tour. I'm so excited and proud that he's asked me to do that. Um, 9th of March in the South Bank Centre in London. Uh, in Birmingham on the 10th of March at the Rep. And then in Manchester on the 11th of March at the O2 Ritz in Manchester. Come along. Let me know you're coming if you uh, tweet me or, or Instagram me at Talalaban. Talalaban. And uh, I'll make sure to try and come and say hi or something. Um, okay, thank you. Let's get back to it. Enjoy the rest of the show. Love you. Um, I mean, I think that... Um you've given me so much to think about uh, you know in terms of my own uh, you right i mean i think i mean i guess you've thought a lot about um um what it is to be a comedian really i mean you you've articulated a lot of things that i've felt but never really managed to to bring to the front of my brain i mean there's i mean is that a conscious i mean you just evolve these ideas or is it part was it I don't know, is it being a surgeon? What why 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 do you know so much? <laughs> <laughs> why are you so clever? <laughs> yeah, because I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> um yeah. I well I think I mean I think we've really well, did we want to touch on Palestine a bit? Because uh, we the last okay. two episodes we're on a bit of a streak. I don't know if you want to talk about it, but uh, we had we the last two episodes we uh, spoke about. Uh, we've done Palestine focused episodes, um, so maybe this is a way of transitioning out of it because we had a non Arab Muslim who went to Palestine, then we had a Jewish South African who spent a lot of time in Palestine on the other episode, and now we're talking to an Arab, but we've pretty much avoided talking about Palestine <laughs> with the actual, with the first actual Arab no, we've had on the show. As a matter, yeah. as a matter of fact, <laughs> as, as a matter of fact, uh, my wife is half Palestinian. Her father is from Gaza. Uh, and so, you know, you can get more Palestinian than this, you know, but the thing is, I, I, I it, it is very, um, I have, you have to be very careful about how you use Palestine uh, in or uh, as a, as a political discussion point. Because I'm telling you, there are no one can speak about Palestine like Palestinians themselves. And there is so many Palestinians who live inside Israel, who live in the occupied territory in Gaza and the West Bank. And they have a different and the people outside are the more they are basically they are more royal than the king. Right. And they uh, there there is a way to um, there is a kind of like. Um, how do you call it? Um, a more of a witch hunt that if you don't speak about Palestine in the sad, same exact tone, in the way that we want, you are going to be labeled as anti-Palestinian or pro-Zionist. All right. Which like happens to me like I in, in, and, and there's like a, a in, in, it really hurts us as Arabs and people who are pro the Palestinian cause that we do not make a, a very, very clear distinction because what does it mean to be a Zionist or does it what does it mean to be a Jew? Because there are many liberal Jews who are on our side. But the thing, like John Stewart, for example, John Stewart is someone who came up many times and he talked about like the atrocities of the Israeli forces in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And yet I was accused of being... Uh, uh, anti-Palestinian, pro-Israeli, because I was on his show because he's a Jew. We, as Arabs, we are not educated enough, many of us, 
are not educated enough to talk about this and we end up at the end of the day being hateful because we do not we, there is a big distinction about your political view and about your religion about where you come from right i uh, like there is for there is people who are arab israelis like arabs who live in israel who do not want to be a part of this and they want to live their life and they don't want to be like pulled into the political discussion right and then yeah. and instead of winning them over are shooting them away so the whole this this whole and i think this is like a big like a smaller part of a bigger issue which is all or none it's like the george w bush thing if you're not with me you're against me there are people who just don't want to be part of it all right and you do not need to alienate those people too there is a way to talk about palestine that is beneficial for the palestinian people but when you go in with hate with anti-jewish anti anything that does not work talk exactly like you it is it is counterproductive for your cause it is very dangerous i think we have a more nuanced way of talking about it on this show and alexi is uh, one of the liber- liberal jews that you mentioned uh, i'm himself. one of those liberal jews um and uh, yeah we yeah and yeah but uh, no it's a fair point i mean i think absolutely that, uh, yeah 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 i i hate it when people push their hate onto me just and they, they assume i will jump in on it because i'm arab they assume i will enjoy their anti-semitic jokes or or whatever it's like i don't want anything to put hate in my heart i'm i love and support palestine Absolutely. that doesn't mean i yeah. hate anything um they they don't have to go hand in hand yeah yeah and for example like if, if I, i'm someone who lives like like if someone there like there is like ways to talk about especially that we have to admit that we are late in the game. Arabs are late in the game. We are late in the in, in the media game. We are late in the political game. We are late in, in, in that kind of game. So they have already, uh, the Israeli point of view has already been established and popularized in the West for more than us. So there is an in the smart way, an intelligent way in order to come in. So for example, if I'm in America and I want to talk about the Palestinian issue, I will not talk about Israeli Palestinian and the bombs and whatever. I will just talk about like you know, I would love to talk about the Palestinian issue if I am allowed to talk about it because as an American, I'm an American citizen. I can talk shit about the American president. I can <laughs> say the most horrible things about the American president. But I if I talk about the Israeli government, I will be labeled as anti-Semitic. If I call up yeah. talked about the Israeli prime minister I would be labeled as him. If I question the kind of aid that America gives, as I'm a taxpayer, I'm, a, I'm an American taxpayer, that where my taxes is going to Israel and other countries, even in the Middle East, who ab- take a lot of aid money from America and then abuse it, whether they, with Israel, would it abuse the, the Palestinian or other Arab countries who abuse their own citizens. If I talk about that from uh, about Israel, I'll be talking about anti-Semitic. So there's a way to talk about things by showing people what you cannot talk about. All right. Okay. And then yeah. that would pay yeah. me people as questions. Yeah, uh, that's a, a very um, novel, different approach. Um, wow, you've just flown in from um, Los Angeles, and you, you're in a, your hotel room in yes. Paris. You're gonna, you're gonna go. I'm, I'm just wary of keeping you. We'll let you go in a minute. Really, you're gonna, you're gonna like try and stay up, or you're just gonna crash now. Or you gotta go and no, go I'm to the to stay up to, to beat my jet lag. You need to beat the jet lag. So if you sleep yeah. now, I'm not gonna be asleep. So I'm just gonna try to like drink coffee and be <laughs> up. <laughs> what are you looking forward to doing in Paris? Well, tomorrow we're gonna have uh, the first uh, patch of interviews with the Arab comedians. So this is gonna be something I'm very, very looking forward to. Mm. And after tomorrow is my show. Of course, I look up. That's gonna be the beginning of the tour. So hopefully we're not gonna jinx it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm I'm very excited. I'm excited to come to London next week. So promote the show, guys. Yeah, we're only forty percent. Absolutely, we're kind of like I think forty percent sold, but like there is still like uh, it, uh, ten days. So yeah, tell your yeah. friends. We will. Yeah, let's promote this shit. Here we go. Uh, Fucking promote the shit. Once again, Thursday the 9th of March in the South Bank Center. Uh, Basim Youssef and yeah. with uh, myself and Omar Bedawi, my favorite UK Arab comic. He's one of the funniest 
mother crushers I've seen out there. Uh, Arab or not, he's just so funny. And that's the whole point as well. Like, why should our race define us as as, as artists? But still, uh, Omar Bedoui and myself opening for Basim Yusuf on Thursday the 9th at the South Bank Centre in London. And then the next day, the 10th, is what I have in the diary, is Birmingham at the Old Rep. With uh, uh, And then after that, on the 11th, Basim is in Manchester. I can't remember which. Where are you playing in Manchester, you know? It's, it's the O2 Ritz. The O2 Ritz. Alexi, I have something to tell you. Yes. I, I have a, I have a, so on the 7th, when the, the, the day that I arrive in London, I am doing an, a promotional interview on a TV show. Guess who I am going to be on his show? Oh, Michael McIntyre? No. Um... Piers Morgan. Piers Morgan. Uh, uh, Piers Morgan. Piers Morgan. Oh, fuck. Kasumak. <laughs> <laughs> fuck. Yeah. No way. <laughs> That's going to be an interesting what? show. <laughs> yeah. Are you, well. Okay, this it will be yeah. interesting because you will have a debate. You'll probably lay into each other. And I suppose that's what TV is for, isn't it? To make it something interesting, not just two people who agree with each other. I nodding, don't care as long as we sell tickets. I don't care if I am yeah, on the, yeah. with the devil on his show. <laughs> well, I, somebody told me once that um, uh, just laugh at his jokes. Find him amusing and then he will be really nice to you. Will be my That is what I have, I have been told. Yeah, fuck that. Or yeah, we like, can go into a fight, make that segment go viral, and it will yeah. even be better. Yeah, yeah. That's the one. Oh, you could take him. I mean, you could fucking... He's, he's flabby and fucking, you know, degenerate, <laughs> you really. You could that. fucking have him, man. You'd, because yeah. you're Arab, he's probably going to try and uh, talk to you about refugee. the refugees swarming our country and swarming the beaches and shit. He's going to try and hold you accountable for our, for our land being overtaken by refugees. So... Uh, I, I actually look forward to seeing seeing what comes of that. Yeah, he's not an idiot. He's he's. I mean, he's sort of venal and um, you know, it, coming to the end of his usefulness, I think. But um, he's a you know, he 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 probably bans. He'll probably be all right. I would think really. All right, um, we're gonna put this out as quick as possible so that people can hear it before the yeah, show. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for coming on. Thank you. And hopefully, hopefully, see you on the ninth. At the yes, I would love yeah. it. It would be amazing to have you, Alexi. Please. Yeah. And tell your friends, yeah. Alexi. Tell your white people. I tell will. your white friends to come to the show. I can't just have Arabs in the in the theater. Come on. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. I will. Thank you. I haven't, don't have many friends, thank but. <laughs> Yes, you do, okay. Alexi. Come on. Don't, don't get depressing at the end of the episode. Bring some energy no. when we say goodbye. Come on. Uh, I'm so ill. Oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, bye, everyone. <laughs> bye, Basim. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thanks for having me. See right. you. Bye. You've been listening to the Alexi Sale Podcast. This show is produced and edited by Talal Karkuti. Music by Tarbush Records. Thanks to Audio Boom for hosting us. Please keep your emails coming in at alexisellpodcast at gmail.com. Goodbye.